Hello, everyone, and welcome to You Thought You Knew, the podcast where we talk about survivor players that we think are underrated, underappreciated, or just misunderstood. Each week, we try to answer a question that's designed to make us challenge our preconceived notions about this famous survivor. And of course, there are no right answers. This is just a way for us to talk about our favorite show. As always, I'm your co-host, Nigel Bocanegra, and I'm joined by my partner in crime, my co-host, Kevin McLean. Yes, it's me, Kevin McLean, and I'm excited yet again for another episode of You Thought You Knew, our fifth and final episode of our season, which has been really exciting. You know, this entire time we've talked about really great Survivor contestants um, in uh, Poverty Shallow, Colleen Haskell, Dreams Heard, Susie Smith. You just came out last week. I highly recommend if you haven't, you know, give Susie a chance, y'all. And now we're going to talk about Tom Westman. And I'm really excited to talk about Tom today. So I think we can kind of just get into it. You know, dramatic intro queuing up here. After winning with one of the most dominant games in Survivor history, Tom Westman became immortalized as the shark-killing silver fox of Palau. And even though... His success came at the expense of ultimate oolong underdog Stephanie LaGrosa. Tom Westman was universally beloved. But how did the political environment of this era contribute to his overall image? A New York firefighter winning right after 9-11 may have done him some favors. And Tom was still so popular. Even Survivor fan sites with notably snarky and large queer fan bases like Survivor Sucks had still fairly high approvals for Tom. Though Tom has still had his critics over the years, some arguing that Tom Westman was not nearly as epic or as heroic as he seemed to be, and in fact gave us a boring cakewalk of a season in Palau. On this episode of You Thought You Knew, Tom Westman, we will discuss this legendary contestant and try to answer this question by the end. Was Tom Westman even better than you thought? Now, normally, this is where we introduce the guest that we have on the episode, but today we're doing things just a little bit differently. We have no guest. You are going to be hearing from just Kevin and myself. Yes. Uh, how exciting. It's just going to be the two of us. And I think that's a fun way to do our final episode as well. And uh, I think a chance to see a bit more of an organic conversation that we have. You know, as a Survivor super fan couple, we talk about Survivor all the time. And I know for most people, you could be a bit more of a closeted Survivor fan, you know? Like, you can't tell people because people are always like, wait, that show's still on? And, like, to have someone you can talk about and always bounce ideas off of all the time is just great. I mean, and there's probably countless times where I've, you know, walked into the bathroom while you're taking a shower and be like, oh, Nige, tell me your favorite Zero Vote finalist right now and tell me why it's, you know, X and Y. And so it's just, I think, fun to be able to talk about a fun contestant like Tom Westman uh, just the two of us as well. So I think this will be a really exciting uh, discussion. And you're really not exaggerating when you say that we talk about Survivor all the time. Walking to the grocery store, we'll play a game of let's rank each of the runners up. You know, we, we always find opportunities to talk about Survivor because we are joined at the hip literally 24-7. So, Kev. Let's try to set the scene as we usually do to make sure that everybody is familiar with Tom Westman, uh, trying to jog people's memories if they haven't seen, you know, either of his seasons in a while. So what are the typical back of the baseball card facts that you'll share about Tom? Sure. Tom Westman, notable for winning Survivor Palau, where he was the leader of the dominant Karor tribe. He tied the record uh, for most individual wins in. Uh, for immunity that season with five. So he ties that with Colby who had set that record uh, in season two. And uh, you know, he was just very universally beloved at that time. He returns 10 seasons later in heroes versus villains where he's ultimately booted fifth, but before going, he takes out one of the most legendary contestants ever in Suri fields in an idle place. So uh, you know, Tom is a winner and a pre merger, but I think there's a lot of Tom um, to discuss between that. And, you know, I'll add that on top of the uh, tying the record of the number of individual immunity wins he has in Palau, he wins a total of 17 challenges when you take into account the uh, tribal phase with the individual, I'm sorry, the tribal immunities and rewards, which is truly an incredible amount. I, I think when I think of Survivor, I remember that there are quite a few challenges but realizing that someone can win 17 in one season really tells you how many challenges they're even playing while you're out there if you do in fact make it to the end yeah i think it is impressive and you know you asked me the other day um 
you know, if you could be on any survivor tribe, what tribe would you choose to be on? And the answer is Karor, right? Like there is not a better answer here because Karor means that like, listen, Tom and Ian are going to get you food. You're going to win all these challenges. Yeah, sure. Maybe you're dealing with Janu and Karen every now and then, but like, that's just the fun of it all. And I can totally understand why like a lot of the Karors have never returned because their experience will not nearly be as easy. You know, like Katie Gallagher will not have an easier time upon a return because the Koror tribe was so dominant. And um, I think a lot of people thought of Palau as, uh, you know, maybe a bit boring, not as much as competitive because there's not all these like power shifts that are occurring. But I thought it was really cool to see a season where like one tribe was just so dominant. And, you know, um, I just remember being really enthralled the entire time watching it live. And, you know, now that I think about it, you, of course, on the Crores, you have Willard who goes out earlier than the rest of his tribe. Uh, and and so there are going to be eight of them that make it past the Willard boot, right? And that means that when Stephanie comes to join, the, the eight of them get to final nine and only have to go to one tribal council. You know, look to someone like Michelle Fitzgerald, who is able to get to the merge in her first season without going to any tribal councils. But to get to final nine with only having to go to one, I mean, that's that's a pretty sweet deal yeah. <laughs> if you're going to be on Survivor. I do want to give an honorable mention, though, to uh, being on the tribe of the haves in Fiji if you're <laughs> going to choose any one season to have maybe the cushiest experience yes. possible. And I wanted to mention with Willard, though, Willard, a uh, uh, fun fact about Willard that I always remembered was that Willard is the first contestant to be eliminated without a chance at winning immunity because it was a double tribal boot which is why Karor, you know who never lost an immunity challenge had to eliminate someone still but quite often there's usually an individual immunity challenge that exists to kind of give everyone a chance in vanuatu like john kenny um wins individual immunity and then he's able to give it to one of the women on the yasser tribe so like usually you have an opportunity but willard really kind of stands out as someone who never had a chance not even tribal immunity or individual um and uh uh I was gonna say R.I.P. Willard, but I think Willard's alive, so maybe I should have put that out there. But uh, uh, it is just a really fascinating season. I had just rewatched it. I showed it to my dad, which is a great season to show like any casual Survivor family members because it really is like so survival based and really kind of wraps you up in it all. I, I just I can't really sing it enough high praises. It's a very epic season, and I I've always you know told you that I think because of my uh, perspective on Survivor is influenced by the fact that I started watching during Kagi on. I really look at Survivor as an anthology series, almost in the way that you could look at something like Goosebumps, in that there is a different book for the story that you're looking for. You know, there are so many different iterations of Survivor, and Palau is a really unique one. It's the only, quote, oolonging that you have where there is a decimation of one tribe. And I love that there is a season out there where that happens. You know, I don't need that to happen every season or even often, but I love that there is a story where that exists. And I love that Survivor has such a variety of stories that exist. So you're you're really able to kind of choose your own adventure. And I think that Palau is always an interesting one to take a look at because of that. So, you know, Let's really focus in on Tom here. Kev, what are your initial gut reactions on Tom? What are your thoughts on him? So um, I love Tom Westman. He is, I'm going to say it right now. Tom Westman is a top three survivor man to me. I had to, I had to so that could still be like top 30. Overall. That could be like, you know, like 50th uh, because I am a gay cliche. Like I love Sandra. I love Suri. I love Parvati. Like, you know, what else is new? But, you know, when it comes to the male contestants, you know, I, I don't feel like I have as much connection because, you know, I grew up as a queer survivor fan is closeted and like I'm rooting for these fierce ladies to really take it home. And so Tom Westman, I think, as one of my favorites, really stands out as very unique because he's an alpha male. You know, and to have an to be rooting actively for an alpha male and be happy with that experience does seem a bit odd because quite often, you know, as fans, we don't like like a pagonging. You know, we don't like it when some people get picked off. We don't like it when the status quo stays intact, which kind of happens in Palau. But I found it so fascinating still because I think Tom Westman is literally that charismatic and that great. And I just I I love Tom Westman. And I, I think I came to the conclusion the other day was that Tom Westman is fierce. You know, like he he is fierce, like he's fearless and bold. And generally, those are those are things I really like in a lot of my like survivor, like badass women. Right. But Tom, I think, really has that. Like he has so many great quotes that he uses, both in Heroes versus Villains and Palau. Um, yeah, it's like a 
well, there's an episode quote in Heroes versus Villains. It's like, um, uh, tomorrow we ask for our forgiveness. Oh, you know, I mean, I'm totally butchering it. But like, Tom is just is just like he's he's so bold in the way that he plays the game. He feels like the type of guy that is not afraid to go into like a duel, like in the 1800s, like Alexander Hamilton and all that jazz. Like he's just he's like he's like ready to do that. And like, there's something about that intensity I really enjoy and you know generally i don't like contestants who have like a really strong moral code like i kind of want you to be able to like flip on people and um uh you know have this really fluid game but for tom it really works for me because i think it's so special in the way that he does it and i think his conviction kind of adds to this intensity of this character i really enjoy yeah tom definitely gives off the vibe of someone who if they were on the challenge would volunteer to go into elimination in order to spare one of the members on his tribe because he is confident that he could come back and keep the group intact so i i think that that's you know certainly the energy that i pick up from tom well least. yeah and you think about so many survivor seasons where we where you think it's strategic optimization you want to hear people like kind of flip on their allies it's like you think hey if you're going to be the next one voted off and they're going to split votes vote for your ally who they're splitting it between to advance yourself one more spot but like tom weston's more likely i'm not going to shoot my ally i'm going to try to advance for i'm not going to give him any of my pieces and so he kind of plays like this really much bigger game even if he's not the most like analytical person like i feel like ian really drives a lot of the strategy you know he's able to identify greg as like a uh, game theory threat i think before tom is able to but like tom's willingness to you know even strong arm people which i think he's gotten criticism for but i think it's like kind of fun like it's like he's like he can be both good and evil but like he's just so direct and so logical and uh he killed a shark i mean i i can't like speak he's just a badass like completely like a total stud um and uh yeah i, I feel like i'm even rambling now i just i just can't you know express as much appreciation i have about tom uh were you always a tom fan or like what's because you watch heroes versus villains first yes i did watch heroes versus villains before i ended up watching palau and you know i i was semi spoiled on heroes versus villains i knew that sandra would go on to win that season but i didn't really know the placements beyond that and you know, it was probably a bad idea to watch it that early in my fandom because there were so many people I was not familiar with. So, and, and disclaimer to the fans out there, you want to get someone a survivor, don't show them heroes versus villains first. I think so many people ruin their survivor experience because they hear it's the best season of all time and they jump right into it. It's just like, you don't know these people yet. Literally wait. And I think that has actually hurt Tom's legacy because people see heroes versus villains Tom first, who I also love because it's like a very different Tom than the Tom Palau, but like this, you know, two sides of the same badass coin, in my opinion. But I think that's like one reason why Tom's legacy doesn't hold up nearly as well for some people because they see heroes versus villains first. And so I, I know I kind of stepped on you for a moment, but like, do you feel like that was kind of part of your experience? Absolutely. When I first watched heroes versus villains, you know, because I knew that Sandra was the winner, I think I had a much closer eye on the villains tribe. I'd heard so much about Boston Rob and, you know, was looking forward to seeing his gameplay. So I, I, I think I was very much watching the villains tribe, whereas the heroes, I think I was not maybe paying quite as much attention to. And I found the pre-merge heroes to actually a little more difficult to follow exactly what was happening on that tribe. And so I think for me, Tom ended up getting lost in the shuffle. Um, I, I, I was, you know, sad to see Suri go. And because Tom is associated with that, I, I, I don't think I was like the biggest fan during that watch, but Going to Palau, I absolutely loved the experience and loved what Tom brought to that season. Uh, you know, I actually was going back uh, to the RHAP season rankings that happened between 40 and 41 and saw that Palau was ranked 18th. And I was shocked to remember that it had been ranked that low because I actually did a ranking when they announced uh, that RHAP rewatch and I had Palau third because I love the epicness uh, of Palau. I think it's certainly a Greek tragedy uh, that you could look at it as because you essentially have part one, the destruction of Oolong, and part two is the destruction of Ian. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's kicked off with Stephanie trying to get a foothold, is 
unable to, and then you kind of have the end game of Kuror play out. And I think that Tom's journey in Palau is really interesting as a viewer because he is, I think, very present in that first half for being on a tribe that only goes to tribal council once. And I think it's in an episode where Oolong also goes to tribal council, right? But Tom, I think, is very visible. And I think it's, you know, obviously partly because he is a winner of the season, and so they want to show him. But I think he's easily remembered because of his like archetype if you will he's very much captain america uh as you had previously mentioned in the first couple of years after 9 11 new york firefighter uh he's really strong on his tribe i think he has um a bit of the unique look and being like the silver-haired fox on that tribe as well so he really does stand out to me and i was really i think impressed with his gameplay the first time that I watched Palau. And interestingly, the second time, and even the third time in a bit of the rewatch uh, with your dad recently, I was actually a little less impressed with Tom's gameplay, but more impressed with Tom as a character. Oh, that's interesting uh, way, way to put that. You know, and, and so this is a character appreciation podcast, you know, but quite often people talk about Tom in gameplay, which makes sense because he's like this winner. And but I, I think there's just so much to appreciate about Tom as a character, as a figure that kind of pushes stories forward. Um, you know, I, I give Tom a lot of credit because thank God Tom was on Palau, because if Tom wasn't on Palau, does Karen and Kobe make the merge? Like, it, like, and we get to have those types of characters in the end game. And, and most times they're not going to get there. So we get to see that dynamic play out because of Tom and you know, what's interesting is that when I was watching Palau originally, I was totally in this tank, like most of America, for Stephanie, right? Like, I mean, how can you not root for her? Um, and it's like, it, it felt unfair because like Stephanie has to go against these like really big, strong guys and like Tom and Ian and Greg even. And, you know, she's, you're rooting for Stephanie this entire time. And after she goes, you know what, Tom's like a great guy, yada, yada. But I was, a re I really liked Katie. Like she really spoke to me as like a very kind of sassy personality. I really identified with that. Um, so I think, there was a time in my life, probably, back probably when I thought Becky should have won Cook Islands, in fact, <laughs> one of my worst opinions that's never aged well, that, you know, like, Katie never had to win immunity. So, like, Katie has a case in that sense, but, like, and I think that sometimes people discredit Tom because he could have gone home without winning immunity. But, like, I think the older I get, the more I appreciate Tom, and I think that's because now that I'm 30, um, and you're 32, by the way, you know. Uh, 30 as well? Yes, yes. Uh that Tom is just like a really good like manager. And I think the older I get and the more I advance in my professional career, the more I think I'm really drawn to that. It's like, you know, he's, he always has a good debriefing. I feel like he really understands timing and making sure that everyone's being heard. Like Willard says early on that Tom and Ian always have something nice to say about someone every day. They always kind of give credit to people. And like, you know, if you're gonna have a heroic character, I think you yeah, have someone who really kind of walks the walk. And I think Tom does that. I think the worst thing a hero can be is, is like, super hypocritical. And I think it's impossible to be like perfect right um but i think that's why like the heroes and heroes versus villains post tom right the heroes that make it to the merge i think don't feel nearly as heroic because it's like they're kind of flawed or not like great right because but like tom is like willing to go down for his values like in heroes versus villains he like speaks up for stephanie you know when like james is like berating her you know he's like um uh, make that two or make that three. Like he jumps in, he's willing to put himself in the line of fire to protect someone he cares about. And there's something really heroic about someone willing to risk their, their life in the game. And, and especially considered a modern survivor where everyone there's everyone's flipping every round. Like no one has any loyalty to anyone to see someone care so deeply about someone that makes them like, you're able to trigger emotional responses. I think you actually get a little bit of that with like Liana and Shan actually in 41 is moving and, and kind of special to me. Um, but I, I wanted to talk about, something you said about Tom being like the silver Fox kind of like alpha male captain America to me, like Tom is like the archetypal father to the show, like the archetypal, like father figure. Obviously his relationship with Ian is very clear to us as like a father. Um, and he's like a good dad, right? Like, and, and it's like, Tom's like the dad you all want in the way that Tina who won several seasons earlier is like, I think the mom you supposed to want, I think they actually are really good. Um, it's like I would ship them if they both were single uh, at that time because I think they both really kind of capture how America felt about. Yeah, Tom. Roles. Tom really gives off like uh, little league football coach energy, right? Yeah. Um, I 
you 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 said that Tom seems like he'd be a really good boss. I would love to work for Tom Westman. Yeah. You, you know, I I think that he does a great job of leading his tribe while while you know, I I think putting his money where his mouth is. Is that the phrase? Yeah. Okay, good. Putting his money where his mouth is. And I think that Palau is the example of how that works out. And Heroes versus Villains is the example of how that does not work out. Mm. Mm. And you know, something you had actually mentioned earlier about your fan, your fandom of Katie, because she has a bit of an attitude to her. If I recall correctly, Tom, Ian, and Katie are all relatively from the same part of the country, correct? Yeah, yeah. Uh, New Jersey, Katie, Tom's from like Long Island and uh, Ian, even though he's like from Florida and I think his like Chiron because he's a dolphin trainer, but he's really from like Pennsylvania. So, you know, I, I've also always loved Katie because I love her attitude as well. And I think that Tom is actually a little underrated in the attitude that he can bring. I think, you know, he has like very sharp wit and I think, you know, quite possibly part of the reason that I, also, I think have a strong affinity for Tom is, you know, my dad's family is from New Jersey, Long Island. Uh, I have family uh, in the exact same part of Long Island as Tom Westman. So I think that I very much pick up on a, a bit of the um, the edge that you get, I think, from being associated with New York City. It's a bit a, a city that has, a, yeah, has like a tough reputation in a way. You know, you're willing to kind of like punch back. And I think that Tom really does embody a lot of that. And he's not afraid to. And I think that's just so cool about him. I, I one of the, oh, so a quote that I will remember correctly this time. Uh, when he votes for James, uh, he says, all mass, no class. And I'm like, oh, he's so fierce. And like, again, willing to kind of, you know, throw back and like really, he remembers receipts very well. Like when Ian is like stumbling in the end game and he says that like, you know, Tom and I had a gentleman's agreement that we would try to make it to the final. T and like uh, Tom says at Tribal Council, it wasn't that we would try, it's that we would do that. You know, it's like, he's like very quick and he's like not going to let you take a beat. And I think that's like, that's again, what I kind of like about my outspoken survivor girlies as well is that people who are a little bit more confrontational and, you know, he's really willing to kind of stick up for something, speak out about something. And uh, I, I just really enjoyed that, especially um, in Plow. I think, you know, had he, I, I think there's a lot of alpha male leaders Think of like Andrew Savage. I don't think nearly would be as epic if he was in that same role and probably not nearly as successful because I think we saw what happened to the Morgans and I think Tom is a better manager and a better boss. I'd rather work for Tom Westman, you know? And I think that is as you get older and you have worse bosses in your life and you meet people that you start kind of looking back and you're like, oh, Tom is a really, he's a good guy. I really like Tom. And, you know, I think the, uh, the quote about James, you know, all mass, no class. I think part of the reason that quote is fun and works so well is because, again, I think Tom really does put his money where his mouth is, where he, he like really believes all the things that he is talking about and really, I think, tries to um, avoid being a hypocrite and really mean those things. And if he was more hypocritical, I think we would probably view quotes like that as uh, far less endearing. Yeah. Right. And Tom is classy. I think he's a classy guy. I think you you read his Heroes versus Villains bio where they asked him. In his Heroes versus Villains bio, they say, who do you, like, which Survivor player do you respect the most? And he says, Jen Lyon. Oh, he's such a good boy. And when they say, when they ask, who do you respect the least? His answer is, well, I don't know everybody that well, so I can't comment on who I respect the least. Like, what a way to not answer the question, but come out looking really good. Right. And he's like a real gentleman. Uh, and it's just like, he's just, he's, I just love that of, uh, about him. Um, uh, I think he's classy. And I, and I want to kind of go back to this Tom Tina theory that I have, which is that like, you know, Tom is like this like father figure. And I think Tina is this mother figure in the shows are both positively received. And it's like, why were they so successful? Why were they both liked by America? Um, you know, what do they have in common? So I wrote a few things down. Um, I think both feel young. You know, they're both like around the same age. They're in like early, like late thirties, early forties, right? That, that range, but they feel young. Like, like Tina f swims in the flood, you know, and yes. she's like kind of peppy and excited for experiences. And she's like very grateful for the experience that she's doing. She's like, uh, you know, I want to teach my kids that like, you know, moms also want to have fun. Moms also want to have adventures. Um, and then Tom is also feels very youthful. He talks about like, this is like a little boy's adventure. Like he really takes this adventurous attitude. Like when he kills the, the poisonous snakes, um, I guess venomous, venomous snakes. 
venomous. Yeah. Okay. The venomous snakes. He when he whacks the shark with the machete and was like, "What did you do?" And he goes, "I hit her with a machete." Like he's just like on such a high. Like they just have so much, I think, zest for life. And I'd like to think I would hope to have that also at their age. Um, so I think that's a huge thing. And I think they're really interesting. Like, like I said, foils that Tom is like northern. Tina Southern, right? I think they're both kind of like classy in the way they handle also conflict. They don't ever, you don't ever hear them really yell at people. You know, they, they tend to be really good at tone and kind of trying to like, you know, mediate a bit. You know, when when Tom and James get back from the tribal council where Stephanie goes, he says, you know, James kind of says like, I'm just, I'm, I'm just pissed. I'm just annoyed. You know, I'm just angry that I hate losing. And Tom goes, maybe just a little gentler next time. You know, and it's just like a very... It's, it's like a very strong conviction and, and like and like these are the expectations I have around the people around me, which are what good parents do. And I think I kind of see that in the way they manage the groups they're in, the alliances they're in, the social relationships that they build. And so I think that probably contributes to their popularities because they kind of fit a, a, a prescribed role that we have for them. And that does make people tend to like kind of um, resonate with you more. So – you know, we've talked a lot about Tom so far. Are there any other moments from either of his seasons that, you know, really stand out to you that you want to touch on? So I will say the buoy, the the, mm -hmm. the final immunity challenge with Ian, where he's on there for 12 hours. Um, and he just like, he sets a record essentially. And I think it's really impressive that he's able to do that. Uh, I want to give an honorable mention to a moment where Katie Gallagher has come down off of the buoy and is there next to Jeff Probst. And she literally just like, is in this oversized t-shirt that she just like pulls over her knees and just kind of goes into a fetal position where she's, it, she's like clearly just trying to like cuddle up in bed. And there's a moment where after, you know, hours of silence, Tom and Ian start talking and Katie kind of just like perks up and like rolls over. And it's just, it is absolutely someone who is like groggy in bed, but she's just in an oversized t-shirt on a platform in the water. Yeah. It's like really funny. Um, I will also, uh, I think the Tom idling out Suri was actually an incredible moment. And I love Suri. Like Suri is like one of my favorite contestants of all time. I like Suri more than I like Tom. But when Suri was booted, I was like, wow, Tom is so good. I can be at peace with this. That is how much I thought Tom West was so cool because that idol move was unprecedented. It was a split vote and they just flipped one. They only took three votes. Him, Colby, and JT was all you needed. And there were eight people in the tribe still and they were able to dismantle this majority. And obviously Tom goes out next. So it's not as if like he broke the game open, but I just remember like the calculations required, you know, was really impressive. And I just want to give, you know, Tom credit for just being so like smart and analytical um in the the challenge where they're chasing each other um in the in palau right they're in that big course and they they're carrying all the weights uh um, they're like uh varying knee deep depth of water, water. something part of the track it's much lower than, than yes. the other half. so in that challenge as they're running around tom acknowledges we'll make a dash during the shallows where the water is the the most shallow. That's when we can run and make up time. And then we'll just kind of trudge generally. And they're able to defeat the oolongs. And I think people should remember that, yeah, the cores were dominant, but they were not expected to be. The oolongs were the tribe full of the young athletic people. You know, the, the Tom was on a tribe with Janu and Karen. Like these are Willard. not Willard. Willard. I mean, these were not a strong group. So he really had to play his hand. And I kind of love this, you know, um, wisdom, defeats like brute strength and a lot of the challenges are not blowout after blowout a lot of them are actually far closer than maybe people might remember looking back on palau just because it is so lopsided in the results and i think that you probably can point to a lot of influence of individual players on the ability to just eke out a victory time and time again and i i think that you do have to give tom credit for contributing to some of those eking out the wins and you know, also keeping camp life right like he uh like when they win the fresh water supply and jen's like oh we're gonna take a shower now because that was the reward was marketed as like you're gonna win this like tub of of water 55 gallons or so and tom's like i think we should just use this for drinking water and like the rest of the tribe's like yeah i guess that's the smart idea i guess it's not we'll, the fun one but i guess we'll do that like one. and and generally i don't care about those things i generally don't care about camp life when I watch Survivor, I don't really care about challenges per se. Like being a challenge dominator doesn't usually endear me, but like, I think Tom is so charismatic and it like, he feels like such a good leader that I'd be like, I would listen to him and like to have someone who's able to do that. I think it was so special. Like he really got overperforms for a challenge beast. He overperforms to me as a um, alpha male. And I think that's just like that Tom really has this like it factor that I think some people 
kind of forget when they kind of just look at Tom from a hundred feet away and they're just like, Oh, you know, he was just, he dominated. So it's that season was boring. He it's, he's, I mean, was he even that great? And they kind of just push over. But when you kind of dig in there, there's a real, there's a lot of stuff. You know, I, I just actually had a revelation on how it's Karen. You didn't even this let me finish. Or, a revelation. Or as Karen would say, this is a revelation, but I had a revelation where, you know, I was a boy scout when I was younger and I absolutely loved being a part of it. Not for like, merit badges or anything like that but i loved being outdoors and getting to go camping and just you know i i think doing a little bit of the camp life on weekends right and so tom is very much like a model boy scout leader he's someone who you would like want to follow where he's leading by example really able to keep everybody happy and i'm sure that you know that is part of why i also look very favorably upon tom I also want to touch on his final tribal performance in Palau because I think what people probably remember most often is Katie getting slammed and slammed and slammed by the people. You know, one of her best friends out there, Greg, asks her why she was so pathetic where it's like, oh, Katie was not going to be able to win going into that final tribal. You know, in Modern Survivor, I think you quite often actually see juries talking about trying to keep as much of an open mind as possible. Some of these plougers are not trying to keep up that guys in any way. I think that Tom is actually very much underrated in a lot of his answers because I think, you know, we are probably going to more remember the harsh questions that Katie is getting. But, you know, I don't think that Tom is exactly left off the hook by some people on that jury. Jen calls him a chauvinist. But he does such a fantastic job of answering some of those questions. Jen says she thinks he's a bit chauvinistic and, you know, points to the fact that she, in her opinion, saw him as totally undervaluing her game. And his reply essentially is that, I did really undervalue your game and didn't think you were playing because I didn't see it. But I think that you were very much hiding a lot of the things that you were doing. So I didn't see game. And, you know, I was like wrong and realized that. And I think that, you know, if someone starts a question by framing you as a chauvinist, that's a really hard situation to come out looking good in. And I, I want to give Tom credit for the way he is able to answer that question, even if it's always going to be a tough one to answer. Yeah. I, I also credit to Tom when he answers, um, you know, Karen's question. Karen asks, oh, first of all, I just need to acknowledge here because how often will we get to talk about Palau? Uh, when she says to Katie, uh, a couple of other things that I observed, laziest person at camp, bad at challenges, unkind, and betrayed me. Give, Give me, me one reason I should vote for you. And just so y'all know, Nigel and I quote that, mm, Every other day. <laughs> Any Anytime we have a slight inconvenience, lazy at camp betrayed me. Yes, no matter what. Like, uh, you could be stopped by the uh, by a police officer, uh, you know, on your way home. And it's like, uh, this is, that's what I wanted to say to them, you know? Like, it's just, there's just a lot of... we Karen's referenced quite often in our household. Um, Karen asks about their relationship and what was genuine about that. And Tom's like, I'm going to let you answer that. I'm going to let you think about that. And it's like, that's so, like... It's fierce. It's fierce. Like to be, Tom never feels desperate and it feels like he should be desperate because it's like an older man. Who's like a huge threat in the game. Like, and people are literally throwing your name out all the time. Like you should actually be way more on edge, but he always has such a confidence about him. Um, and, uh, uh, He's just like so good. And I also wanted to mention as Final Trouble, he's so humble. I think Tom could have easily go in. Now I'm like at the time where we're talking about everyone's like resumes. You know, he could come in. I won all these challenges. I did this. I did that. I never got a vote against me. Tom's like, you know, I had the incredible experience of a lifetime. I got to, you know, be with all these people, kind of build this group and have this adventure. And, you know, I had to do X and Y, but I hope, you know, you'll you judge me for the actions that I had. Like, there's just something about that. You know, he doesn't feel gaudy and, and he feels like almost the antithesis to Russell Hans, who would like literally destroy his tribe and try to take all the credit every chance he gets. And Tom is like the most heroic, classy version of that, which is someone who, you know, is playing a deceptive game at times still, but, you know, really wants to try to rise above the fray. And I think it's nice to have People like that occasionally, and I think Tom's just a great like symbol of that. You know, so we are almost 35 minutes into this podcast, and I'm sure for everybody listening, you are picking up on the fact that we are both pretty high on Tom Westman. But in an effort to try to be, you know, a little more impartial, 
I'll point out that, you know, Tom is very humble in the uh, final tribal. I, I was struck by that on a rewatch, but I'm sure it helped that like, you know, he gets to be around a lot of the jurors talking about Katie without Katie there. And he probably knew he did not need to toot his own horn that much. Like they did not find Katie to be uh, very effective in the challenges or even contributing that much around camp or nice <laughs> or nice. And Tom's like, I don't, I don't need to brag about how many challenges I won. They are aware. That's a class act though. Yeah. Well, you no, know, it is, but it's also, you know, easy for him to not feel the need to address that early. He, he has the ability to be like a little humble in that regard, but, you know, knowing how a lot of the jurors were probably commenting about Katie to him when Katie was not around again in an effort to try to be a little impartial here. Yeah. And I think actually one of the bigger criticisms I know I was listening to survivor historians, which Mike Bloom of RJP fame was also on uh, a Palau episode. They talk about in the beginning and then this show kind of, which slightly inspired you thought you knew, you know, they want to talk about like kind of what was happening at that time. How are people perceiving the show in Palau? Um, and so like, this is years later and people are kind of writing in viewer questions, all that type of stuff. And people are like, I can't wait to tear into Tom and like, kind of like knock Tom down a peg. As I think, you know, while I sing Tom a lot of praises, you know, Tom has vocal detractors out there who believe that he really kind of berated Ian into like a nervous breakdown and that he was not nearly as heroic. You know, Kobe, you know, does not vote for Tom. He's the one person who does not vote for Tom to win. He's the only juror. Um, and he votes for Katie because he sees Katie as the most honest because she's willing to lash out at others, I think. And he thinks Tom is kind of cheesy and fake and phony. Um, and I think there is, there is criticism about Tom is that like, he is really not nearly as great as we might think. Um, and Kobe says like, you played a, a game as dirty as I wanted to play. And I think there are things you can strike against him. You know, Katie mentions that he kind of strong arms her at times. I don't have any issues with those things, but I think these are criticisms I hear about Tom. Do you, does any of this criticism like resonate with you or make you feel um, like mixed about Tom in any way? Cause I'm in the tank for him completely. I, you know, I'm, I'm a really, really big fan of Tom. I do think that there, you should always be able to, you know, levy some critique against some of these characters. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to, cancel anybody on Twitter or anything like that. <laughs> but I, I do think it is fair to try to, to bring some critique to people. I don't think that anything that Tom really does in uh, Palau or, you know, Cures versus Villains for that matter is very dirty. When you look at like the grand scheme of survivor, uh, I, I think that there's actually, you know, far more volatility in the Ian Katie relationship without Tom, you know, really contributing to that. And I do think there are moments where you could describe Tom as strong arming some of his allies. You know, Katie, for example, when he and Ian kind of surprise her very close to tribal council so that she doesn't really have much of an opportunity to do anything else. But at the final six, at the final six. But at the end of the day, I don't think that that's dirty necessarily. I think that that's, you know, trying to really be able to like come out on top in your alliance. And, you know, at the end of the day, you are playing a self-interested game for $1 million. And I think that Tom identifies opportunities to really exert his influence, you know, maybe in ways that other people are not thrilled with like Katie, but he's also doing it in a way that does not provide a ton of blowback to him. But I think that's also, you know, maybe kind of easy to say, knowing that Tom is able to get to the end in part because of so many immunity wins down the stretch. It, it's always hard when someone I think wins so many individual immunities in a season to determine, you know, would they have been able to get there without those wins? Because that's so many places along the journey that it could have gone into a different path. But, you know, I, I think it's probably important to consider, you know, does, Tom actually get to the end if he's not winning those immunities. And I think he's quite possibly voted out by his uh, alliance members. Yeah, I think so too. I don't think Tom's game is like perfect by any means. I think he, the fact that he's so strong and athletic really helps, but I think he put himself in those positions. He, I'm sure Kroor also succeeded because of his management skills at camp um, as well. The, 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 the providing of food um, and, you know, he's able to give this to these people, a real experience of a lifetime, you know, Janu votes for him because he picks her and he picks her and puts her on the tribe. And Janu had a hard time on Karor. Can you imagine what she would have had on Oolong? <laughs> right. So like, you know, Tom is able to kind of 
help give these people an incredible experience and they're appreciative of it. I do want to quickly kind of go back to the strong army thing, which is a criticism of Tom's that people quite often levy against him. And I think it's part of it's because Tom is so beloved and people want to kind of knock him down a peg that Tom is not nearly as heroic because he strong arms people. But personally, I don't think strong arming people is malicious or bad. This is a game where people literally lie to you. Um, so why is strong arming bad? Because strong arming is actually way more ethical, I would argue. You know, the I think the, a classic moment of this is when at final five, you know, Karen, Katie, and Jen might come together and vote off one of the men. Tom has immunity, or he will get immunity at this time. I don't know when exactly the conversation has, but he says, if you to Katie, if you three are coming together and vote one of us off, you know, the next challenge might really benefit one of us. And if we win it, we will vote for you. So just know that, like, that's a good threat. He's willing to threat, like, threaten someone. And it's people like, oh, Tom, the hero, he threatens people. Like, oh, he's not that great. And it's like, yeah, well, none of those people are even getting close to how getting the goods that Tom gets. Like, I think in the heroism in general, but he's because he's not a hundred percent perfect. They'll like kind of jab that at him. But I think strong arming is totally ethical, and I think it's more ethical than lying to someone because you're being like direct with them. You're being very honest. You're telling them what what's going to happen if you don't do this. And why is that any less ethical than lying? And you know, I think that if you try to put yourself in the shoes of one of the players that's out there, I would prefer. To, to be dealing with that if, if that's how Tom was interacting with me because at least you have the ability to operate with that information rather than getting blindsided, someone going home that you were not expecting, you were on the outs of a vote, you voted for someone who is still going to be there, and now you're in a significantly weakened position. I think compared to a, quote, strong arming situation that, you know, Katie ends up in in the final six where you know at, at least katie is able to be in the majority but i think you know again tom is very possibly not the winner if he's not able to win those immunities at the end and and that is partly why i was less impressed with his gameplay in a rewatch because i think i remembered him being a bit more quote dominant but he is able to get his preferred final three in Ian and Katie at the end, yeah. right? And so he is benefited by all of those immunity wins, but he exercises, I think, a, a very large amount of uh, agency within uh, the game, especially in that end game. And, you know, I think another criticism of Tom that is fair, but I kind of like, like, you know, because it's like, yeah, maybe these are negatives, but I, I like negatively toned characters anyway. So like a hero that has some like negativity, like very much Batman, I can be on board with. And um, is that I think Tom can be a little clicky, right? But like clicky, hot silver fox dad, sign me up. I love that. Like that's so much more interesting than like dad who really is like more egalitarian in my opinion. So it kind of gives him a little bit of edge. Then Kobe, of course, the one Tom detractor, the one person who does not vote for Tom, you know, is the one who's kind of telling us throughout the pre-merge of Palau that, you know, it's Tom, Katie, Ian, Jen, and Greg, those five, and the four of us are on the outside looking in. And, you know, Tom is not the most inclusive in bringing those people in all the time, even though he does work with Karen later, especially with Kobe. And I think for Kobe, it's a sensitive spot. And I, you know, we're watching, I got very emotional because I connect with Kobe's story as a, as a gay person. And um, about, you know, Kobe being like teased a lot in school and feeling he needed to drop out of school because like he was not accepted by the jocks. And so I think for some people, Tom represents that jock who, mm -hmm. you know, is loved by production, loved by the administration, maybe in a school or a peer group or people or like the church or the community, but like actually is not nearly as great as you think he is. And so you have a little bit of issues with that. Um, but I also think Tom really is a team player. And I think, you know, some of Kobe's challenges that he admits himself that he was never part of a team. And so like he kind of perceives slights as like um as as more personal than i think tom even intends them to be or, or sees moments as slights when certainly tom is not intending them to be but i think maybe uh certainly at times along the way kobe perceives them as purposeful slights yeah and i think technically tom and i think maybe like today you know maybe tom would come at this differently and i think it's good fair criticism that tom could be more inclusive you know tom could be even more you know accepting to to people making sure they feel like they're part of a team but you know we also hear people say that tom compliments everyone so i feel like tom is doing stuff but maybe he's not listening enough to 
like people like Kobe. And I think that is a criticism of him and certainly a criticism. I think people who tend to less be less high on him. I'll also say, you know, some people do not like the fact that Tom came into Heroes versus, versus Villains gunnings after Suri so much. You know, Suri and Tom both kind of identified each other as threats, and it hurt my heart. And I was like, no, just vote out Amanda. Why are you doing this? And I was really glad they sacrificed Sugar in the beginning. And Thomas said post-show that when they got to Ponderosa, Tom and Suri, that they're like, you know, we really probably should have worked together from the beginning. But Truly a cursed timeline that we lived in. It is really like the the timeline that we needed, but I'm sure in that timeline, the JT letter doesn't happen. And so maybe Heroes vs. Villains is actually a worse season. But I like to believe if Tom and Suri were the endgame players, that it would just be as great. So yeah, I, I love Tom. Any final thoughts on Tom before we kind of dig into the research data aspect of our podcast? Yeah, you know, I, I did want to uh, touch back on the points that you were making about Tom not being as inclusive as maybe he could otherwise be. I, I do think that is a fair point, but, you know, he's in a strong five in a tribe of nine. And at the end of the day, you know, that is a tight margin, but he's also benefited from the fact that I think his five are like five of the strongest people. And five of the fun people. I, I Listen... You can choose to be in alliance with Kobe, Janu, Willard, and Karen. That is not, listen, and I think they all are fun in their own ways. That's not a fun crew. That's, that, that's a group that's very negative, actually. They're kind of complaining. And I think Katie, as much as she might be negative to us, you know, she does puppet shows for them. Like, th like they're the five that are, like, doing, like, the team chants. And, like, they're, they're just having a little bit more fun. And I would have been drawn to them, too. And I probably would have came off clicky as well because I would have really liked that group a lot. And, you know, you have the majority five out of the nine on that tribe. And, you know, I'm sure that they assumed they would have hit tribal council a couple more times before the merge happened, right? And I think in most seasons, it's fair to assume that the Willards and Karens of the world are some of the biggest targets to go in the tribal phase because they are going to naturally be perceived as some of the uh, weaker people on the tribe. So like, of course they are more likely to be targeted. So he's in a tight five. So I think he, you know, is actually in a, a pretty good position um, within this clickiness, but you know, for, for all the critique of the clickiness that's happening, you know, he's still, I think is really able to win over Janu and Karen compared to Katie and you know it, I you can get away with being clicky if the person you're sitting next to in final tribal is perceived as far clickier than you are and you know I'm sure that Tom was you know aware of the perceptions of both himself and Katie amongst some of the other tribe members where it's like yeah you know no one has to believe that I'm perfect but I'm at least well positioned within the group here yeah. right Okay, well, with all of that being said, let's let's finally get to some of the research that you did so that it wasn't all for naught. So what were some of the things that you came up with? Yes, for? and so like on this podcast, it's about character, you know, appreciation, character analysis. And that's also about how audiences talk about characters. Who are these people to us? Because they represent things to us as well. Like, do legends live on? Do they die? So I looked at this the 2016 Reddit popularity poll that I've referenced in some of our earlier episodes. Um, I want to ask you first, Nige. Who do you think ranked higher, Palau Tom or Heroes versus Villains Tom? And I want to clarify, I have not glanced at the printed piece of paper that Kevin has next to me, so I really am going in blind to this research. I think that Palau Tom is going to be ranked higher, you know, partly because he gets rid of Suri in Heroes versus Villains, and she's such a fan favorite that I'm sure that that at least, you know, tanks his numbers enough to be below Palau Tom. Yes, um, that is correct. Ooh. Platom is higher now. There was 575 entries that were ranked because each each player's return counts as a, an entry on this list. So 575 players when this poll was first done. Where do you think Tom Westman Palau, the better Tom, ranked? And this is uh, around the time of like Ko Rong, Mulder yes, versus Gen X, 2016 ish. Right? Um, I think it's you know I, I want to guess a very high number because he's you know I, I think one of the more well-known winners he's a returning he's on heroes versus villains Palau I think is a talked about season uh but it was also you know I, I think a fair bit of time after heroes versus villains and he doesn't go very far in it I'm gonna say top 75 top 75 yeah Number 29. Okay, well, I was I was clearly pretty off there, but I, I guess maybe I was just assuming that the um, uh, recency bias would have worked against him because there had been enough time between. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's a fair point. So Tom Westman was ranked, Palau was ranked 29th. 
Um, what rank do you think within his season he was? How many Palau contestants do you think ranked above place 29 in this poll? Okay, so for anybody on Oolong, you know, <laughs> they're all pre-mergers except Stephanie, right? Yeah. Bobby John comes back, uh, so, but I don't think that he's going to be r- ranked below Bobby John because I think that he's um, better better a bigger character than bobby john ends up being in either of his two seasons uh stephanie you know was just in the traders i don't know i've seen a lot about it on twitter i don't totally know what's happening but you know stephanie was a huge name uh she's a three-timer so i feel like stephanie's probably going to be ranked above um and then for anybody on karor i i think that ian is probably viewed less controversially than Tom because he just is not a finalist. So I don't think he is going to be receiving the same amount of critique as Tom is. Again, I could be wrong on that. So, so I think I'm, he's third. I'm going to say third. Number two. Ah, so he was the second okay. highest in Palau Below. ranked. Ian. Okay. So, which is actually interesting because at the time, definitely it would have been Stephanie. Um, but I think Stephanie, because she, she had Guatemala, and that's, of course, affecting, you know, voters in 2016 as they think about who Stephanie is, and then she flops in Heroes versus Villains, you know, even before Tom does. So I think they kind of hold that against her a bit. And her edit is not nearly as positive uh, in uh, Guatemala as it is in Palau. But to be honest, can anybody have a more positive edit than Stephanie in Palau? I don't know that anybody has had a more ideal outing as far as, like, I want to look good. If I'm going out on Survivor, has anybody ever looked better than Stephanie? I'm honestly not convinced there's anyone who looks better. Yeah, and you know, in Guatemala, she you know has more negative edit because she's a losing finalist, so, so you they have, have to, to show, show the negativity, and she kind of has power hungry. It's like it's like she, uh, Stephanie is an underdog. Stephanie is an overdog, and Stephanie as an overdog did not have the nearly the same amount of charm. She felt a little bit more entitled. I think that's the way that she was being described, and so you can see that same Stephanie in Palau. So it's almost like you're watching the oolongs, and she's like complaining about her tribe being so bad. It's like, girl, you're part of the problem. Then, like, but like as James Clement would would say, and it, and that's to say that like I think Stephanie, you know, was great at challenges and she was doing a lot of stuff. But like, and one thing I love about Tom was that we get a real like she's a real foil to the oolongs' failures. You know, like Tom is seen as this like great leader all the time, and you know, some things criticized a bit. You know, Karen like talks about like oh, everyone has to be like, oh Tom, what does Tom want to do? But like you come back to the oolongs and they can't even choose a leader half the time. They get rid of Jolanda first. And so like Tom, of course, is like, I think he's like a better character for that. And so I think Stephanie kind of has been hurt as time has gone on a bit, but she's ranked still fairly high. So only after Ian. Um, and I think at the end of the day, Ian is just like such a, I, th- I think uh, he's like such a sweet character as well, who does not have the same, I don't think he's described as clicky in the same way that Tom was, and especially Tom was the winner. So, and I'm sure that part of the reason is because Ian struggles a lot with having to make, um, you know, game choices between some of the people he's like such good friends with. And, you know, he is obviously a part of the reason that uh, the minority members of his tribe end up going. But I think because it is so high profile how much he struggles with parts of the game that people probably just focus more on that than, you know, how comfortable he was getting rid of the uh, Willards, Kobe's of the world. Yeah. Right? And, and Ian's like gawky and, and kind of funny and i think there's a lot to appreciate he's like a him. fun goofy energy yeah. yeah and you know he's like best friends with katie and it's like that's that's a check in my book you know so i think understanding that ian was ranked higher than tom so then we have now um what i wanted to also mention about tom's ranking in palau uh his standard deviation considered very high so tom actually is a little bit more polarizing it's not as if all the numbers cluster under one though he is generally popular obviously he ranks very high um and uh demographic data so they'll show in this poll like what types of people tended to like certain contestants more was it mostly women mostly men and so they showed that um tom's most favorable group straight people um his least favorable group gay and bi voters okay well you have one gay and one bi voter here so clearly we do not match the trend we yeah, <laughs> right we don't. we're not like other gays and bi's i guess <laughs> i <laughs> well and and for the record you know you score them on one to ten and Tom's overall score was an 8.1. By straight people gave him a score of 8.6. Gay people gave him a score of 7.1. So it's not it's like it's still pretty, pretty it's, well ranked. It's significant because I'm sure that does play a role. You know, it's a significant variable that I'm sure affects certain voters and how they perceive Tom. Again, I think probably gay voters are more sympathetic to Kobe 
for example. And and, and, and Kobe is literally an opposition figure to, to Tom. Tom and Katie, who's also kind of like the stand in for like the sassy, like girl, you know, best that, friend that I think gay men type tend to really, really enjoy. And I also fit into that stereotype. Um, you know, maybe hurts Tom's legacy a bit as well um, with those people. But like Tom is still being rated high by drops him down to a 7.1 instead of. Yeah. So it's still very, very high. So I wanted to mention that heroes versus villains. Tom, he was ranked 173rd. So still really high up there. Ultimately, you know, definitely like I think it's like top uh, quarter or so. Um, and here I wanted to mention his positive correlations who are people that tend to kind of like correlate with Tom's scores. So, um, and someone who correlates both with Palau Tom and Heroes versus Villains Tom is um, Cook Island's Jonathan Penner. I think it's the older man. Think of it all. Mm-hmm. Maybe wisecracking. Who's, you know, like very much trying to uh, be able to stay, make something work, kind of, you know, like working in opposition to uh, some of the other people and is not able to, you know, actually like end up pulling it out. Mm -hmm. and you know so all the positive correlations that were listed for either version of tom included africa tom buchanan uh panama terry deets uh guatemala gary hogaboom uh ian you know from palau himself and negative correlations so these are people who either if you rated tom highly you'd rate those people negatively or you rate these people highly and you rate tom negatively are all women stephanie favor from cook islands jatia Edna, uh, Christine uh, from South Pacific, Jane Bright from Nicaragua. So I think clearly like gender does play a role in the way that people are perceiving Tom and perceiving Palau. And I think Palau is a very masculine season in the way that we did the Vanuatu recap. And Vanuatu is a very, I think, more female driven season. And so like, um, you know, even like Stephanie, I think is like a guy's girl in the way that she's kind of presented to us. And it's like the women are like coasting on the men. Like I think most of the women will actually get fairly negative edits, except for Stephanie and Angie. Um, they're seen as either coattail riding or as lazy or as like only obsessed, interested in like showmances and um, like quitters quitters. Like they don't, this is Bobby John describes Tom as a man amongst men. So it's a very masculine thing. So I'm not surprised that like, if you like Tom, you tend to be people who tend to like other um dominant male figures in survivor um but i think you can like tom and still also like jatia right like i don't think these are present you don't like them for this you don't like them for the same reasons and that's totally fine to me you know and i think um like generally i don't like pagongings but i think the first pagonging is incredible because it's different because it was the first season and so like you can have different values at different times in the show something i've mentioned before to you is you know in early Survivor, we love the strategist, Kathy Vavrick O'Brien, um, for example, Rob Sesternino, of course. These are people that we really enjoyed because a lot of people were not super strategic or gamey. Now, I love it when someone's not strategic or gamey. Give me a Keith Nail. Give me Keith Nail. Because it's firefighter. Re- because it's refreshing and because it's different. Exactly. Another firefighter. Um, and so, like, again, like you can have different feelings about contestants at different times but i think generally people tend to have a demo a different a specific type of person and tom usually fits in with a more masculine um survivor character so uh tom generally uh liked in both of his seasons none of this was surprising or um no i don't think any of it is is necessarily surprising i think you know i probably would have assumed tom was a little bit lower ranked from palau and a little bit higher ranked from heroes versus villains but it kind of just evens out i guess okay so i also looked up tom um a few days ago on the subreddit just kind of see what are people posting what are people sharing so most people talk about tom you know again about gameplay they're always comparing him to someone uh who who's the best challenge beast who's the best winner like tom is always kind of being mentioned i think there's sometimes pushback against him so people like to talk about tom very much in those terms um and uh, something I did notice that there was this one thread. It was question: Why is a majority of the subs so high on Tom Westman? Zero upvotes, <laughs> by the way. And they mentioned I will caveat this with the fact I have never seen his first season pull out, and I'm a fairly new Survivor fan. Started watching during the pandemic, and he mentioned they thought Tom was like condescending and yada yada yada. Heroes versus villains, and like in the comments, people were like. Well, well, it's probably tied to the season he wins. <laughs> yeah. But like, again, that tells you a lot about like, you know, maybe the order in which you watch tells you a lot because yeah. it's like, of course, maybe Tom doesn't seem like nearly as heroic if 
he's on Heroes versus Zones. Maybe you should know why he's a hero. And I, you know, I guess and if, if you're in the tank for Suri, you're probably not thrilled. Yeah, and so I just think there's like, and, and James was super popular as well. He won fan favorite yeah. twice, and so maybe if you started with China, yeah, maybe you think like Tom is out of line here. You don't you don't actually appreciate the way that he's talking to James. And maybe if you've seen like China and Micro, you're you know looking at him being in opposition to James, Amanda, Suri. And, you know, he's a member of, like, the minority on that tribe and goes early. And the people that you were already higher on are the ones who make it out into the merge, yeah. right? So, or, you know, obviously, sans Suri, but I'm sure, I'm sure that that's part of it, too. Yeah, so, in general, um, I, I think Tom is still, like, a liked player. A lot of people talk about winners at war and, you know, why wasn't he asked? And I think Tom is looked back on still very favorably today though i do think he still you know has detractors who i think are frustrated with the fact that he gets such a golden boy edit yeah i i, I do think that that makes sense with what my perception uh of the perception of tom westman is and i'm sure that you know a lot of the people who are quote detractors of tom want him to be viewed in a more realistic light in their opinion rather than tom's actually awful and no one's talking about it you know like his his overall rating is still really high so i'm, I'm sure that people don't some people don't love the golden boy edit that you can kind of view him through and would just prefer a more true to life depiction of and tom. you know tom is like in that survival lens right that challenge lens and like that's not why a lot of people watch survivor today Right. Especially yeah. the internet community. You know, we tend to like the strategists and the people who are really good at giving commentary, people who are also very vulnerable. We love, you know, people who have like the emotional like moment on the show. Yeah. You know, we know that like users of Reddit tend to be uh, younger, wider, and more male than the average American. And if you're younger and online, you, I, I think, probably more often came to Survivor probably after pull out first aired yeah then you know at the time and so i think it's hard it's also like again you know around 9 11 or after 9 11 even though it was a few years after at that point you know we were casting a lot of firefighters a lot of police officers there and you know cultures do change think about how i think a lot of americans feel about policing is very different than it was in the yeah. early 2000s and that's not making a value judgment at all right it, now. it's just but it is something it tells a lot about how happened. like we kind of shift and change and the kind of we ex we want different types of things and um you know, I don't think we'll ever have a Tom Westman again because I think the game is different. But I kind of love how Tom Westman is like, he's like a survivor god. Like he's, even though he gets a golden boy edit, I think it's like something worth aspiring to. And I think that makes him such a, a wonderful character um, to me in the way that he takes it very seriously. There's something very noble about him. It's like, uh, I remember people talking about that movie Wonder Woman. And why was it so lauded, you know, uh, and not just because it was like a female representation, which was a huge part of that, but it's because the director really kind of leaned into the cheesiness, leaned into the moments where like a lot of like movies who are superhero movies, it's like, think of like Deadpool. It's like, they're cutting away and like being like, this is like kind of over the top, isn't it? But like Wonder Woman never did that. And Tom doesn't do that either. And it's like, let us buy into the journey you're experiencing and let's feel the drama. And that's, I think why Palau feels like an epic and heroes versus villains is during the Tom phase feels like an epic at least because he He's like really living it with us. And so I, I think Tom is still very popular, but you know, at the end of the day, new fans, I think are just never going to understand what it was like to watch Tom at that time, or just be closer to that or be aware of what the culture was like at that time either. So, you know, I, I do want to get into some of the research you did on the perceptions of Tom back when, you know, Palau and Heroes vs. Villains first aired, but I, I want to make a slight disagreement with you when you said that you don't think that there will be another Tom Westman. I think if you look at Tom from a, a more general archetype point of view, I think, you know, a lot of fans would probably point to Mike Holloway and Ben Drebergen as, you know, a new school version of Tom Westman, where they're, you know, kind of the uh, framed as an all American hero man who tends to be amongst some of the older people within their casts. And so, you know, I, I think that they are not a one for one for Tom by any means, but I do think that you could look at them as a maybe sequel or, or a new version. Of and I Tom think Westman. another one is Jeremy Collins as well. A, fi a, a fire firefighter. firefighter. And obviously race, yeah. I think plays a role and maybe some people are not making that connection as easily, but I think, you know, he's also heroic. These are all heroes, all American family, guys. man, family, man. You know, we have Jeremy like cry about like, you know, Val and like, it, they're all like rootable, especially to the casual audience, not as much to the internet fans, right. Who had to have a little bit more uh, criticism. And sorry to interrupt you, but I just want to say 
love Jeremy Collins. Oh yeah, he's great. Um, but I do think at the end of the day, those are they're all different because we'll yeah. never talk because they didn't kill a shark. Tell me when they kill a shark, then they can be Tom Westman. Tell me when they um, bring a Karen to the final five and they can be Tom Westman. Like, I think at the end of the day, while they can have like an archetype in the way that, you know, we'll have other um, overconfident women who America hates, like Jerry Manthe, who I will uh, love, but we will never have that Jerry Manthe level because Survivor's also not watch at the same rate as it was back then. Like, you, you won't be able to capture that, even if there will be people who are in that mold. I don't think we can ever truly have the Tom Westman experience fully again um but i asked cbs to try because you know let's see, see, see what you got but i don't i think it's really hard to get there you can't it's like capturing borneo it's like magic in a bottle i think palau kind of like does that too even though we've had tribes be kind of semi-decimated like in 41 shannon ricard um i think denise and malcolm like you have tribes that really kind of lose people but these are like six person tribes going down to two yeah the, that's not the same the matt singh journey is always one that can be really interesting and uh moving at times but I, I i don't think that any of them will ever you know match that same energy live i'm sure uh to palau where you have the first and, and only true decimation of a tribe yes and, you know, again, with Stephanie, why her, I think, story has never been appreciated as much as it was then is that now we have, like, Exile Island and stuff, or we did a few years afterwards. It's like, she was only alone for one day. What's the big deal? Like, she didn't even go to every tribal council like Denise did. Like, I think there's, like, it does not feel nearly as special, but it's, like, the slow disintegration of this group is part of the charm. Um, and I think that's lost over time the same way that, like, Tom's dominance, I think, is lost a bit over time, but he's still fairly rated, so I really shouldn't complain. So... Moving on to how he was perceived at the time. Um, so there was a book that I referenced. I kind of want to quote Karen. Here are some things they observed. Yes. Here are some things that we observed. I have here the book Tribal Warfare, Survivor and the Political and Consciousness of Reality Television. I referenced it in the Poverty Cast where uh, they ranked all these different survivor contestants the polling data survey data i don't know i don't own the book but i did have a screenshot from when i was in grad school and i checked the book out of the library it's not a screenshot i guess it's a little picture in front of a the page where they had all the data uh printed and um they had all them ranked number one was colleen haskell who of course was still america's sweetheart and this was right after palau so it's five years in so this is a really good way to capture how tom was perceived at the moment tom was ranked 14th overall really impressive only behind stephanie at that time so i think that tells you just how popular he was um does this track for you is this surprising um no it's not surprising if he's ranked 14th that means that like he is going to be like the 1.5th highest rated person uh you know by the number of seasons and he's just behind stephanie who's like one of the biggest names of the franchise after palau air so that completely makes sense to me no oh, great and then i have a survivor sucks poll from 2013 uh, where I looked at where they ranked. And so I said mentioned earlier, I'm a suckster. Can you give people a little bit of context uh, of what Survivor Sucks was? Because it, it's, you know, a place, quote unquote, that I had like kind of heard of, but I think it was disbanded by the time I even started watching Survivor. And, you know, I'm not sure because I've kind of left it. And I was, it, it sucks has, Survivor Sucks was just a fan site. And you would not think it was because they would complain all the time, uh, by the way. Which it, is classic fandom. Yes. Right. And I think a lot of Survivor Sucks' opinions exist on Survivor Twitter now. Like, I think a lot of them have yes. migrated over. I think, you know, the subreddit used to be a lot more male, young male strategist. And I think that still exists. But, like, definitely now there's a lot more, like, meme queens. Like, Jatia is, like, loved on the subreddit now where, um, you know... And I think she was probably loved back then, but like, I think they were maybe not nearly as like appreciating the camp of it all uh, for years. Cause I think people have left sucks and moved to other places, but like sucks generally, what I loved about it was that it was like a more queer pro female, like contestant pro villain part of the fan community. And this was like literally like a message old school forum. message board. Yes. Right? Yeah. And you know, all these rankings and like lists and like, uh, and, and very, shysty messages like like posts about people and like fun nicknames and i want i want everyone listening to know that kevin has 
certainly over the course of our relationship, gone back and found the, like years old threads being like, I remembered this comment that I needed to show you. It's like a moment in somehow found a it. moment in survivor history, you know? And I was, I was like, I was telling you earlier, you know, there was like nicknames for everyone. I remember sugar was called Splenda because sucks hated <laughs> sugar, you know, at the time because she had caused like crystal Cox to lose. It's a very snarky place. It's a from snarky what I understand. place. And you know, I found really refuge in that because you know, the larger survivor community was much more pro male, much more pro survival, much more pro challenges, you know, because uh, it was like a casual fan base. And I think also like America, right? They like the, they liked men and men always got bigger edits. And so like Survivor sucks was a place where they were like, yas, UTR girlies, you know, and I'm like, yes, they deserve attention too. And, and let's, let's talk about those things. So I found Survivor sucks to be this neat little corner of the internet that I loved um, and I thought it was so funny and 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 smart and clever. Um, but I mentioned in the introduction earlier that Tom is still fairly favorable, even there on sucks, which is not a place you would expect because in just let's say when the subreddit data, you know, gay fans, bi fans tend to be a little bit less high on Tom, though still fairly positive. So I looked at their 2013 popularity poll that they had. They ranked all the contestants yet again. Where do you think? Uh, so it, actually, 443 entries. This is 2013. So this is uh, Karamoan time frame. Where do you think the Toms landed here? The two Tom Westman entries. Hmm. Okay. Well, I I I think you know just looking at uh, the subreddit ranking of him being like 29th and like 175. I think there's got to be a similar spread. Uh, if he underperforms amongst gay and by fans it would make me think you know potentially lower on sucks but it's it's you know the numbers were still pretty close i don't know i'm gonna go with like i'm gonna go with 35 okay tom westman heroes versus villains is ranked higher than tom westman palau because i think again it's like the underdog effect interesting uh, and uh heroes versus villains tom was ranked number 98 palau tom ranked 117th Oh, okay. so both in the top 25%, essentially, or around that area. Um, but I know because it's, it's very pro female, like bias for the contestants and the characters that Tom, both Toms are still ranked in the top 40 of all the men, though. So it's <laughs> like, again, he like overperforms for male contestants. And I like overperforms for his archetype, his archetype. Me. And I will tell you, here's the biggest example of why I think Tom is so special to me is because I hated Terry Dietz. And Terry Dietz always was kind of described as a poor man's tom westman and I, this is not terry personally i think terry is a character because it's like right. how dare this man keep winning these challenges and ruining the kasaya's march to victory this is horrible like the kasaya's are so much more interesting and dynamic i want to see them succeed um and i've come around on terry a lot more because i actually really like cambodia terry a lot but tom and terry were considered very similar archetypes they're, they're both, only separated by guatemala they're both in largely male um uh, older men uh leaders in largely male industries very much i i think a typical profile of like all american hero challenge dominators they both have the record for immunity challenge wins right tom like i said top 40 men of all time in sucks by 2013 comparatively terry deets bottom 10 bottom 10 bottom 10 terry deets was not loved oh my god <laughs> and so like how can and i think that's also like tom is like you know, he's so similar to Terry because they have similar archetypes, but like one is loved and one is not. And that tells you that I think a lot of that Tom really has, or maybe what Terry doesn't perhaps. Um, and like maybe their roles in those stories make Tom still even popular in a place where you not expect him to. And I think that's, that's why I think early on when I asked, is Tom Westman better than you think? I think he has to be because it's like, you're, you're loved by all these different types of people. And sometimes for different reasons, like that's like, that's like a, a triple threat, you know? Um, so that's kind of where Tom was. He's still like was popular in 2013. Is this surprising at all? I think you thought he was going to be even more popular. So maybe it is. Yeah, I thought he was going to be more popular, but I think that knowing that Terry Dietz was a bottom 10 contestant in the same poll, I, I think I am more impressed with, uh, with Tom's overall ranking on sucks at that time, knowing how poor the Terry Dietz uh, was, was perceived. So I also want to finally share an article from after the Palau finale. They say in this article um, from today.com, they mentioned Tom 
whose affability and fatherliness masked 39 days worth of strategizing handed him an easy victory. Tom played the game aggressively, dominating challenges and turning his back on his friends when he needed to. Quote, you tell lies or do whatever you got to do to get ahead, end quote, he said. But his likability overpowered his duplicity, and in the end, that made him nearly invincible. Um, they also mentioned in this article, quote, you can't beat this guy, Katie said while the jury took turns verbally weed whacking her. <laughs> but Tom didn't win just because Katie attracted less than friendly feelings from the jurors. And in parenthesis, it says, Greg warmly noted that Katie was worthless, insignificant, embarrassing, and pathetic. Karen was much kinder and said Katie was just simply, quote, phony, cruel, and the laziest person at camp and bad at challenges. <laughs> so, so Katie was slammed so, so hard. hard. It, it's like truly incredible. And like, this is what I always thought the chaos cast's experience would have been had she made mm. the finals. I had like maybe Tony took her to the end. Like that was like the end game scenario there. So they mentioned that Tom deserved to win because he ultimately was an innocuous choice. He's strong. He's hot. He's both a father figure and a firefighter who played the game as hard as he could. He was always prepared to deal with the consequences of his actions. Unlike some of his fellow tribe members, he stabbed a shark with a wooden pole. What is there to dislike? Still, Tom was never a safe bet. Had Karen allied with the other women instead of running to Tom to reveal their plans, Tom would have gone home a few weeks ago. Tom was viewed as a threat. Heck, he won five of the seven individual challenges. And let's not forget the shark. So I think you can tell that Tom was still like loved even then. Um, and that I, I I like the fact that Tom is an enduring figure, but I, I want I want to make sure he's an enduring figure. I feel like I'm like, I'm like a a person who's like, so you start making monuments of Tom so people don't forget how great he is because I, I worry that as the show shifts and I'm I'm a, such an old school fan that like I'm worried quite often about how the show is like perceived, how, how like legends are remembered that I will like to make sure that Tom is loved. Like if Survivor had currency, Tom should be a, on a coin. <laughs> you know, like, like Thomas Jefferson. The nickel? Yes. I hope so. Someone's going to fact check us. And like, no, but it is the nickel. I'm I'm like so much worse at the presidents than you. Oh yeah, I'm from Virginia, so we have a lot of them. You do have a lot of them. It helps a lot. We only had two. I'm from California. Yeah. So, um, so what? Which president do you think Tom Weston is most like? Now I feel like we have to answer this question. Okay, which president? Who won in a landslide? Which president is most Tom Westman like? Okay, this is going to be like really um, niche. No, not, not not niche. It's gonna. I, I, this is like maybe like a little dramatic of an answer, but I'm hear me out. I'm going to say Abraham Lincoln. And and I, I know, I know that kind of sounds ridiculous, right? But, yeah. but just hear me out here. You know, I think, I think that part of what makes Tom Westman um, have that like special something that has maintained a very high, uh, I, I think like ranking in the minds of many fans, you know, we've had 43 winners now. That's like a lot of people that you need to, to keep up with. Right. But I think that part of the reason that Tom is remembered so fondly is that I think he's actually a really great role model for people, you know, someone that people can like look up to. And I think for like many people, when they think of role models, they think of um, famous people who have done like really, really incredible things Abraham Lincoln, for example, yeah, um, who who are remembered for, uh, you know, I think these like really noble moments. Um, but I think that, you know, the reality is that people are far more gray area than we sometimes idolize people as, you know, for as much as people absolutely, you know, fairly appreciate what Abraham Lincoln did. There's also, you know, criticism for, uh, you know, like, maybe his respect of like individual rights during the civil war, right? Where I, where I think that there should always be fair critique of people, because I think if you idolize people and choose to never um, consider that people can do wrong, that I, I don't think that that's necessarily a good thing. I think it's, it's important to, if you were finding people that you were like looking up to, to, have a, a fair critique and understanding and a more holistic understanding of who they are. So am I still crazy for saying that? No, Tom is I, like Abraham I, let me, let me add, let me add to this. Um, and I'd appreciate it if you make me sound like a little less. Well, that, well, insane. Tom Westman and Abraham Lincoln leader of a dominant team, Karor, the union mm, decimated okay. the other side. Okay. Um, this makes Stephanie sound like she's a Confederate, uh, but, uh, is not what we're, we're not saying argue. at all. We're not saying at all folks. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, dominant figure who is today looked back upon very, you know, uh, positively. I think historians rank Tom Westman very well. <laughs> <laughs> Presidential historians rank Tom Westman. Westman. And yeah. Abraham Lincoln and Tom Westman, uh, both seen as very favorable. Seen as kind of strong arming, a little bit martial, a little authoritarian, you know, but like mm -hmm. that kind of adds, it's like, so someone had to take charge. It was chaos down there. So um, I, I think, you know, uh, there's a lot of like forgiving uh, mm -hmm. that happens. Good at speeches just like Abraham Lincoln, you know, I just feel like there, yeah, there's some Abraham Lincoln stuff there. So I think a great answer, yeah. Nige. Uh, so, um, yeah, when we start our, you thought you knew presidents series, uh, a little teaser for everyone. So let us know which president you think Tom Westman is most <laughs> like. <laughs> yeah. Use the hashtag Y T Y K for you thought you knew to let us know, uh, your, uh, American history slash survivor opinions. Cause, um, survivor, uh, in American history have so much in common as Nigel and I like to think when we have our long theoretical conversations like this. We're big fans of both. Yeah, big fans of both. So uh, now that we kind of dipped into Tom then, how he's perceived now, I think it's time to kind of start evaluating who Tom Westman really is. And uh, we kind of told a lot of that at the top, but I think we have a chance to really reflect one last time on uh, Tom. I think if you have listened to the full hour and 20 minutes of this podcast, you have picked up on the fact that I think that Tom Westman is, in fact, better than you think he is. I mean, I, I think that Tom is uh, just a, a really fun person to have as a winner of this show. And I, I, I think that uh, I often will refer to contestants that I'm a really big fan of using the quote it factor where they all seem to have a special something that I, I think is a little hard for me to describe, but you know it when you see it. And I think that Tom rightfully uh, stands out in the minds of many fans because I, th I think he's just, I think he's just fantastic. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, so when I said, you know, is Tom better, is Tom Westman better than you thought? I think he has to to be because i think quite often as time goes on we tend to distill people down to like kind of basic uh virtues basic moments like simple because that's like a schema like that's how we understand the world a lot of the individual details get lost in your memory over time and so the the most high level things are what stick with you yes and so like if you sift through it though I, tom is not as nearly as like Tom was not like just like coasted to safety by the end. There were times where he was very vulnerable and he was able to get his way out of that. You know, Tom, uh, you know, was dominant and like, he was an older man who ties that record with Colby, you know? And then we had some people afterwards who maybe it doesn't feel nearly as special, but like, it's still like impressive. Like, I think, um, I think anytime people are, are suggesting that Tom, uh, you know, he's just like a boring winner. I, I think, it's unfair to him. And I, it's like kind of weird because it's like, you have to like, you know, I'm the pretty person who wants to champion Susie Smith of the world. So it does feel um, strange to have to be like championing someone who is like still like fairly popular, but I think like he should be popular and should be popular for a reason because Tom offers us so much. And I think he makes both the seasons he was in better because he is dynamic. He is, uh, he has conviction. He is willing to put it all on the line. Um, and uh, he just like represents I think like the ultimate survivor hero in a way, you know? And, you know, I, I think I had said earlier that I think that Tom is a better character than I remembered him being, but not as good of a game player. But, you know, I, I think upon a little more reflection, I had brought up um, Mike Holloway as a more recent winner that I think has like a lot of parallels and, you know, somewhat similarly as they get towards their end game, they start to get into some trouble with the alliance that they're part of. You know, Mike Holloway certainly earlier than Tom, and they are able to reach the final in part because of the number of immunity challenges that they end up winning. But, you know, I think that Tom does a far better job of um, remaining integrated and influencing the ultimate end game of like who he is sitting with at the end than Mike Holloway is. I think that Mike is like far more on the outs and not determining who is going than Tom Westman's able. And to. Uh, another thing to note here is that, 
You know, Tom's vulnerable only two times post-merge. Final seven, Stephanie's boot. Final six, Greg's boot. At final six, you know, we've been building this moment where it's like, okay, Greg and Jen are going to try to flip Karen, Katie at five. They're willing to vote for Karen at six. You know, had their plan succeeded in Karen, they just sacrificed Karen. Tom likely still wins the last few immunities. He still makes it to the end. So, like, Tom is still, like, position while he likely always succeeds or, or does well in a lot of times and like he's able to idle out Sharif Fields I mean who is a master strategist um and he was not he didn't really pre-game going to heroes versus villains and I I personally don't think like returning seasons count nearly the same way because at the end of the day like once you're a known quantity it's not really a quote fair game so I think you people should not use that as a detriment to Tom and what his abilities were because um I mean how can you not have such a huge target coming out of Palau. Like the entire time, episode after episode, it's like, if we don't get rid of this guy, he's going to win. How can you not like have that target going into heroes versus villains? And, you know, people talk about poverty, having a huge target because of the Micronesia Alliance, but like Tom is like a target for like literally, you know, being a, a good leader, being liked, being liked by America. So he's like also stealing airtime from you, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was no idols on Palau and he finds one of heroes versus villains. So like he literally won a season without idols, something Ben and Mike needed, by the way. Um, I just think Tom has a lot to offer beyond just like the physical component as they do in like the new tribal council format where they're trying to like divide it into slices. Tom really is there. He really underst understood the game theory of it all. And I always remember... The criticism I've always had with some jurors is that sometimes they really care about loyalty, and I always found that weird. Like, I remember in Big Brother, uh, All Stars, the, the first one, the better one, people mentioned, I won't spoil the winner, I guess, here, uh, that they wanted to vote for a specific person who ended up winning, and they said it's because they were loyal to someone. And yeah, I was like, we weren't loyal to you, though, so, like, why do you care? But I think that is something jurors can tend to value in the way that people don't want to vote for someone who's kind of too slimy or too deceptive. Sometimes they want to, someone who could be loyal to something or they stood for something. And I think Tom Westman, like, offered that even as well. Like, he's literally seen as a strong strategist by his fellow competitors and also still noble. Like, who, that's a, who can do both? I mean, very few winners can say both. And, you know, I also think that, uh, I, I do understand uh, valuing uh, loyalty in, in someone's performance in uh, you know the the final vote because I think that can also show that they had a plan and that they were purposeful and that they were able to actually uh, fulfill the plan that they had uh, you know set out right. If you were able to be loyal to your number one and get to the end with them, well, you, you had a plan and you executed on it, right? So I, I do think that there is uh, value in that as a juror. Yeah. as well um and in something i also wanted to mention uh you know here's versus villains is the third i, I guess like large returning season because you have like captains in guatemala right micro is only a half returning season and there are no winners that return for micro right here's versus villains is the second season that has winners on it and all stars one of like the main highlights one of the the initial talking points in the first part of that game is the fact that winners are you know targeted they, they have huge targets on their backs people are going after them and uh, tom westman is the first winner that goes in heroes versus villains and you have to imagine that i i think being a winner at that time still was probably scarier to people uh, and, you know, maybe Sandra made it even scarier <laughs> being a winner who wins twice. Right. But I, I'm sure that there are, um, s some of the coattails of the target that winners had in all stars going into and Tom seasons. aligns with JT for that same reason, you know, because it's like, we are winners. We have to stick together in a way. If we don't, we will get picked off. Um, and so like, clearly that's, you know, his perspective because, you know, he wins only a few years after, all stars and you know tom was invited for micronesia like i think that's something people don't maybe remember you know because micronesia might have been a full all-star season you know it was eight seasons after the eighth season which was all star so it kind of would make sense and um tom declined because he was really worried about hurting his legacy and then a few years later he goes you know legacies ain't that important and I'll, I'll go on still i'll have fun and i think he solidified his, his legacy by being so different than his first time because now it was tom now we're gonna see tom like actually on the outs and try to survive it it's kind of like you know, people often said Sandra would only get so far in her first two seasons because she didn't have to go to tribal council first. 
But then in Game Changers, we see her have to go. And while she does not go nearly as far, I think she, her like legacy is almost grown. I mean, we all were impressed with the number of tribal councils she was able to survive. I, I, I remember a lot of people were like, oh, the first time she goes to tribal, she's done. These people are not going to want her to let you know, to get anywhere near final tribal. And she made it much further than I was expecting. Yeah, and so I think you should think about that as like, when you are very critical of Tom, think about like that he could do both. And, you know, to your point that um, Tom has a very different version of himself in Heroes versus Villains that people can appreciate. You know, production was a really big fan of that, too. I was listening to his talking with T-Bird interview earlier today, and he mentioned that he was contacted for uh, a Blood versus Water season. You know, so production was totally open for Tom to be coming back again, right? So I, I do think that he uh, has clearly left a, a really big impression on uh, not just, you know, the other players that were out there, but with production as well. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't sing high enough praises for Tom. Do you have any final thoughts on Tom? Um, yeah, I, I think that, as I had mentioned, Palau was my third rated season overall and uh, a, a commonality between my highest rated seasons, I think, are the, quote, epicness of them and that I, I truly do look at Palau as a Greek tragedy. And it, it was so fascinating to watch it for the first time and see the decimation of Oolong, to be captivated by the Stephanie journey and being so disappointed when she's not able to pull it out because I was not spoiled on Palau. I, I was truly devastated when, when Stephanie loses. And I think it would have been very easy to kind of want to like tune out after that and and feel like you don't have nearly as much um, investment because now you're only left with these people who, you know, it went to like one pre-merge final uh, tribal council. But I think that Tom Westman and his journey is so exciting that he he's a big part of why Palau, I, I think, is as epic as it is. And I again, I'm aware that the RHAP ranking does not reflect Palau being very high, but I'm just going to say it. I think you guys were wrong. I think it should be rated high. <laughs> and it's still like above average, right? It's again, like it's like we're like fighting hard for something that's still popular. It should be higher. Yes. And, you know, again, because I think that was also happened to me when I was watching live is that I, I feel like I didn't remember the end game. I definitely remember Katie saying that Karen sucks. Like that, that stood out to me very distinctly. And I remember Tom winning, but I didn't remember like a lot of the movement. I was still kind of young as the show was going on. And I think, you know, the conventional wisdom at the time was that like, eh, Palau's kind of boring because it's like, after the Oolongs go, that's where all of our interest is. But like, let's be honest, the Karors are better than the Oolongs. Like pound for pound character wise, the Oolongs are full of like Mactors who do not care. You know, like the worst character on, I guess it's Willard. Okay, maybe it's the second worst character. Yeah, but at, at least he's like the first one out of the tribe. Yeah, it's like, Jen and From, like the characters are like Jen and Greg are like maybe the weaker characters left of Karor, and they're way better than Jeff and Kim are. Uh, and I love that they have the decency to be in a showman's, which like really gives them story. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's so I think like you should not like check out of Palau just because like Tom is dominant, or you should not just go in like oh this is gonna be so like really go in there and be like analytical, and you're like, actually gonna see so much. And like I think like uh you, you, you can really gain a lot of appreciation for Tom, Palau, and Survivor by, like, really being open to the fact that, like, there's actually a lot more going on than you would think. And then, like, it's like, oh, he's just, like, Captain America. Boring. It's like, Captain America can be interesting, you know? And I don't think you should just, like, write it off because it feels like a, like a, a he's, like, a, he's like a golden boy edit. I, I think it's, like, a very dynamic story where he's literally under the gun so much. I mean, the women's Alliance both times want to get rid of him as the, as it kind of assembles. So, um, I, I, I just love Tom Westman and we I'm really glad we were able Tom to do this. Westman. Yeah. Love Tom Westman. Uh, so everybody, we are just over an hour and a half in to this podcast. I want to thank everybody for listening, for putting up with uh, just the two of us today and getting that that bit of insight into uh, what it's like spending time with us on literally any given day. Of the yeah. Week. If you were like in the back of our car, you know, in the back seat while we're driving, you know, we'll to quote Missy Payne, get in the back seat. I'm driving. <laughs> yeah. Let me drive. Uh, this is what you probably would hear from us, which is that we get very analytical. We love to dissect and we also love to um, randomly quote survivors and um political figures occasionally as well mm, you sure. know and it's it's like you know survivor is politics 
just to kind of like connect that one last time. And I hope it's been a fun ride. You know, we love the guests that we've had. We hope uh, we get to do You Thought You Knew in the future. I know people have suggested that we do stuff on Jerry Manthe, who I think is such an interesting survivor figure. I know I had someone reach out to me about doing something on Eric Reichenbach uh, from Micronesia. You know, he's always the dumbest survivor of all time. And it's like, well, should we thought about that? Or if he is, does that make him more epic even like, why not appreciate that? And there's just so many contestants and characters to discuss. I mean, I have talked to you, Nigel, about maybe we could do stuff on big brother contestants one day or drag race contestants one day. I mean, who, who are legends and, and why do they become legends in us? And, and, and how does like our society also make that change over time is very interesting to me. And I'm glad that I've had you to be here with me to discuss that and share that with people and have at least dozens if not more, at least dozens of people find that interesting as well. And so I'm super appreciative of that. Yeah, this this podcast series has really been, uh, you know, our way to, I think, share the way that we view Survivor with uh, a lot of the fan community of RHAP, the, uh, the group that brought us together in the first place. Um, you know, when I first started watching Survivor, I was looking at it as a a game show as a competition show and and was really excited by the big moves that Tony was pulling and and just I I think that pulled me in as a fan with the lens of uh looking at strategy but in over the course of our relationship and our journey of rewatching or re, I guess for you rewatching seasons and completing my watch of all the seasons I think you've really helped open my eyes to looking at survivor through uh, I think probably a far more critical lens uh, and and much more like the survivor book club and I think that that is what gives me the excitement to watch seasons over and over again, because I think that if you're only going to be looking at survivor through that lens of strategy and, and exciting gameplay, I think it can be really fun, but I don't think that seasons will have as much rewatchability if that's the only way that you are looking at the show. So I've really, really enjoyed the perspective that you've given me because it has allowed me, I think to enjoy rewatches probably more than I would have otherwise. Yeah. And that's something that I think, you know, is something that I've always really valued. I always care about rewatch value and most people don't rewatch survivor, right? Like survivor gets millions of viewers and only a small fraction of them will rewatch a season. And we're kind of insane where we're like, yeah, it's been a couple of weeks since we watched the survivor season. <laughs> like what's up on the docket. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's like, come on, let's just watch a few episodes of the pre-merge of Marquesas while we like cook dinner, you know, like, let's just like do that. So it's like, I think to be able to see it in that way is able to, you know, access a whole different point. Cause I think quite often people think about survivor as a game, which of course it is, it's, but it's also the most literal interpretation to take survivor, but survivor is also a story. It's a narrative. It also represents our own society being reflected back to us and how many things that we can see and resonate and invest in. And I love that about art, this show. And I, I, always want people to kind of think about it in those ways, even if they may disagree with my final opinions on things. I, I think it's like to be able to see Survivor for all for what it can offer because some people watch Survivor for different things. Mm -hmm. There are people that still in 2023, well, I guess no one's watched Survivor, a new episode yet in 2023 because <laughs> it's January. But like, you know, post-2020, people are still watching Survivor for challenges, for survival content. If you have been watching since Borneo and you're watching for the challenges, I'm like truly impressed that you've stuck with this show for so long. Yeah, people watch for so many different reasons. And I think it's like, it, the story is a, is a, another reason. And I'm glad that we were able to kind of discuss that and engage with that. So Nige, if people wanted to uh, discuss and engage uh, this with you personally, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at Nigel Speed. And uh, you know, if you want to just tell me <laughs> uh, which presidents any of the Survivor players are, just let me know. Yeah, yeah. Where can people find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Asian Narc, which is short for my Instagram handle at Asian Narcissist. And this has been our fifth and final episode of this mini series uh, that RGP, you know, was giving us. I'm so appreciative of Rob for letting us have a chance to kind of gab a few hours about some really fun Survivor contestants. And um, uh, hopefully we have a chance to do it again in the future. And I just, I, I look forward to uh, discussing fun survivor contestants uh you know hopefully with rjp listeners but definitely with you my partner for the rest of my life fingers crossed uh and you know i i did think about this a little bit earlier today i've listened to countless rjp podcasts 
but I haven't listened to all of them, right? There's a lot of content that comes out and like sometimes you, you have a couple of busy days and miss something, right? I don't think I've heard this on a podcast before from one host to another. I love you. I love you. I thought you were proposing to me in this moment. It was, <laughs> <laughs> it was a really big moment. I was like, oh my God. How? Drag race reference, uh, Victoria Scone proposing to uh, her now fiance or wife. True, but also survivor moment, Maddie proposing to his girlfriend on Inga Bone. Oh my God. Rob proposing to Amber at the finale. Uh, Keith pro Famey proposing to um, that girl on the internet, in the internet cafe. What? He proposes to her. We're kind of like- Also, who is the who is it that proposes to who in front of Amber at a finale where she's like kind of like making a weird face? David Murphy at Redemption Island, Redemption Island finale, runs off stage and proposes to Carolina Eastwood, the first boot of token sheens, to propose to her, you know, to get married. Um, that relationship falls apart apparently because of Alicia Rosa. Um, I know we're getting like into survivor gossip, but maybe these are figures you want us to actually discuss even more and who they represent to us as, as survivor analysts. Uh, this, this last like two minutes of the podcast is probably actually the most accurate depiction <laughs> of what it is like to be with us 24 seven, just like the constant bouncing back and forth, uh, not adhering to a single topic quite as much. Yeah. And, and so I know we've had a few critics out there that mentioned that's like we less structure and it's like, sometimes we need it because we can really go off the rail. So I hope people have appreciated this. I know I appreciated this opportunity. So any final words, Nige? Uh, just thanks for joining us on this journey. It has been uh, such a, a fun time for me to experience. So I hope you got a fraction uh, of the enjoyment out of this that I have. Yeah. Well, this was You Thought You Knew Tom Westman. Thank you so much and good night. Goodbye. Good riddance.